All right. Jenny. Hello. You're coming through fine. Good. You ready for me to yep, go ahead I'm ready. and get started? Let's get okay. started. So just a second here. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jenny Walker. I met her a couple years ago in Washington. Uh, it's really good to see someone building a bee research group over Eastern Washington University. Uh, one of the biologists over there used to collaborate and, and communicate with me once in a while, but they didn't have really a research group there. And Jenny has now established that. She did a postdoc with uh, a scientist on the East Coast that I respect, uh, Richard Fell, Dr. Richard Fell. And she is a molecular microbiologist specializing in molecular biology and the population ecology of the honeybee. She and her students are studying the role of beneficial and disease causing microorganisms on their hosts. And she's asking whether or not a healthy bee gut can mitigate things like nosema and pesticides. So some of the questions that you're asking, uh, Michelle, we knew that Jenny was going to be following up on. So before this, the two of them had a discussion about who's going to cover which what. So I'm really delighted to see we're just down the road and you have to be from the western states to know that when we say 200 miles it's just down the road but she's just down the road from us just like are about the same distance to msu down in bozeman so jenny let yeah. me welcome you to was and um you're all yours great thank you all very much can you see looks good all right Great. Well, yeah, thank you, Michelle, for that great introduction on the honeybee gut microbiome and the really great work you're doing there. Um, thank you, too, for the invitation to speak, the organizers and um, the sponsors who also recognize the importance of understanding the bees from the inside out, in their words. Um, so I'm going to be focusing on the environment and environmental factors and how they influence the microbiome and then how the microbiome can influence susceptibility to environmental factors like disease, pesticide exposure, uh, ability to acquire nutrients from their food source. So this image here is auger art. Instead of using you know, paint, a paintbrush and canvas using bacteria and inoculating loops and auger plates to create art. And this one is great because it combines my love for both bees and bacteria. But I started off my research um, in amphibians and understanding microbial and disease ecology of amphibians that are threatened worldwide by a fungal disease. And so I just want to kind of um, put that out there before I got into bee research, I studied really similar questions and used similar methodologies in the amphibian skin microbiome and how, you know, I, I just want to point out the importance of kind of taking an interdisciplinary approach and um, can be really useful in solving problems. And so, um, yes, those are my daughters there um, in this diagram that I had published in a paper. Um, just highlighting the importance again of what, what we know with the amphibians and how that can be applied to other systems like bees and like, um, like humans too. Okay, so I just want to reiterate the vastness and the complexity and the unknown of the microbial world. So this is a simplified tree of life diagram. Um, showing that only the, the tiny tip of one of these branches is actual visible life, things that we can see, like plants, animals, us, bees, um, where the rest of life is microbial. And these microbes are doing really important things uh, for you know, us as humans and also our ecosystems. And I just also want to uh, point out that microbes exist along a continuum where there are, you know, true mutualists, where they provide a, a benefit to their host. And then, of course, there are pathogens, microbial pathogens that can cause disease. But microbes exist along this. They can shift and, and kind of move along this continuum depending on the environmental context or if there's, you know, some sort of dysbiosis or alteration of microbial communities that can potentially shift the function of these microbes too. 
And um, again, just kind of highlighting some connection with to the human microbiome and gut microbiome. Um, there's research suggesting that the gut microbes can uh, boost vaccine success. So this is for, for the flu vaccine, some research a few years ago where uh, because what we know about the, the microbes in the gut are producing chemicals, those chemicals are interacting with the immune system, our nervous system, and uh, being able to, to alter the, um, the outcomes of those systems and vice versa, how um, those systems can influence the microbiome. And so the antibiotics can alter the gut microbiome, and then that can uh, alter the uh, efficacy of the immune response to vaccines. So there's uh, interesting research there. Um, of course, there's also new research on the role of the microbiome in, in COVID-19 disease severity and thinking about how healthy microbiomes might be able to, you know, through that interaction with the immune system, minimize the, the impacts and the, um, you know, the, the viral loads, whereas altered microbiome might um, contribute to severity of COVID-19. So this is um, really new research uh, out there too. So it'll be interesting to see where that, um, where that goes. And so going back to the honeybees, what I'm gonna talk about specifically are pesticides, nutrition and disease, and how these factors influence the gut microbiome in terms of their structure. So who's there, how much of each of those um, components that, that Michelle described, those core phylotypes, um, and also the function. So what are these microbes doing for the bees? And I also want to point out, again, the, the, some of the similarities between the honeybee gut microbiome and the human gut microbiome and how there are related uh, microbes. And so we can kind of use the, the honeybee as a model to understand the humans better and vice versa. And, and again, thinking about how the structure and function um, influences the ability of bees to, you know, detoxify pesticides or acquire nutrients or fight off diseases and how that's a bi-directional relationship. Or at least that's, you know, what we're interested in understanding if, if it is bi-directional uh, relationship. So I'm going to start with pesticides and some work that I've done on, on that. So nearly all hives have some sort of level of exposure to pesticides. Um, these are data from Virginia um, looking at these, you know, commonly used uh, pesticides and their abundance and quantities in both or in bees and pollen and bees wax. So this is looking at, you know, in hive miticides. I know there was a question about that in, in the, um, in the Q&A before. So looking at fluvalinate. Kumafos, um, also fungicides and you know other insecticides that are used at, in agriculture that bees might encounter while they're foraging. So this is just you know quantifying. There's they're out pesticides are out there and and bees are exposed to them. And then this is uh, another data set from Washington that I've collaborated with Washington State University at Spokane campus and looking at a handful of pesticides that we think you know, might be important for bees. And um, we sampled six sites and multiple hives within these sites um, across the Eastern Washington region. So not as large scale as, um, as Michelle described, but, but um, regional locations and, and then quantified the amount of pesticides in the bees. And I'll talk about later uh, the, the impact of this on microbiome. And in, as far as other studies and um, what, what they found, there are definitely mixed results on the effects of pesticides, various types of pesticides on the gut microbiome. So on the left-hand side are a handful of studies that show that you know, glyphosate, antibiotics, um, in-hive pesticide exposures, so these miticides, how they impact the gut microbiome. Whereas there are some other examples where the microbiome is robust to some of these chemicals or it might actually even increase survival of honeybees um, when they're exposed to low doses of pesticides. So it's very variable, obviously, depending on the chemical, depending on the dose, depending on the environmental context and the experimental context, and if it's you know, cage or hive or whatnot. So lots of factors can influence it. So there's not one 
you know, um, broad answer to, to what's going on. And so the framework for my research is, you know, do these biocides, which kind of, um, you know, encompass those various things that I was talking about, um, how, do they impact the gut microbiome structure, function, persistence, and then does that influence individual bee health? And then how does that influence overall colony health? And if there are impacts on, on, of these biocides on the microbiome, can they be mitigated by probiotics? So I'll talk about some work on commercially available probiotic supplements that some of you all have mentioned. Um, and then I'm also working on um, kind of a homemade probiotic concoction based on some of my findings and, and using some of the bacteria that we've isolated that have been affected by these um, biocides specifically and, and seeing if they can, can mitigate. So um, I'll talk a little bit about um, each of those. So first, um, again, looking at pesticides, I'll talk about uh, the field survey here at Eastern Washington and then a lab experiment that we're doing and then um, talk about an experiment that I did in hives at Virginia Tech with Rick Fell. And so here um, I wanted to focus on imidacloprid, which is a neonicotinoid insecticide um, in particular because we found that it was um, almost significantly different in terms of the concentrations across sites because I really wanted to get a gradient of um, ex, you know, levels of pesticides in the bees and, and then look at that, you know, along that gradient, if there was a, a correlation with the microbiome. So focusing on a midocloprid for, for this work. And here's one of those plots that Michelle showed with these points where again, the, the closer the points are together, the more similar their microbial communities are than points that are further apart. And so each point is a hive sample that is um, kind of a combination of multiple bee guts within a hive. So each point's a hive. And they're color coded based on the concentration of imidacloprid. And then we've, we've found that there was a statistical relationship between imidacloprid levels and the gut microbiome. So the ones that didn't have any imidacloprid in, in red kind of clustered separately, there was some overlap, but it was a significant difference um, than the ones that had higher concentrations of imidacloprid. So this point here, this point here, like these are some of the highest levels of imidacloprid and they're clustering, you know, furthest apart, um, indicating that they have different microbiomes than the ones without imidacloprid. So that was a correlational field survey, no experimental manipulations done, but nonetheless, we did find, find this. And so then we were interested, well, what, what's the behavior of the bacteria in the lab? And so this is showing some um, data looking at various bacterial cultures in the lab and those that were exposed to medium and high levels of imidacloprid. And, and as you can see with all these little stars um, that most bacteria were significantly reduced um, when they were grown with imidacloprid. Um, whereas there were some, for example, over here, bacteria number 40 that did not change in the present, did not change in, in their growth response in the presence of imidacloprid. So I think that's really interesting. And I have a graduate student who is, you know, testing a lot more isolates. She has 500 isolates that she's testing against imidacloprid to try to really get a good sense of um, strain level variation and which ones are impacted and, and which ones aren't. And then tie that back into our field results too. And then when I was at Virginia Tech as a postdoc, I did an experiment in the hive where we exposed bees to chlorothalonil, teramycin, and imidacloprid. And then there was a paper that had just come out right when we were getting ready to set up the experiment that um, found that chlorothalonil had you know, effect on the, the gut microbiome. So that is why we decided to include this treatment, this chlorothalonil plus the probiotic. And this is one of those commercially available, super direct feed microbial from strong microbials that I think someone mentioned in, in the Q&A or the chat um, to see if that kind of um, restores the, the uh, microbiome when they're exposed to chlorothalonil. And then of course controls. 
And so we did this twice, first with three hives, and then I repeated it the following year with five hives per treatment, which is still pretty low sample size, but um, takes a lot of work to manage these and um, these hives. So we did the best we could. And then from each hive, we sampled five bees and pulled them together as kind of the hive sample, um, because there's not a ton of variation in within a hive in terms of the gut microbiome. And we did the B dissections and 16S rRNA gene sequencing, just like Michelle described. And this is what we found. Again, one of those plots, each point's a hive, closer together, more similar. And what we found is that the pesticide treatment did not significantly alter the overall microbiome structure when we look at, at, these, um, at these plots and, and do the statistics. But if you start to look at kind of pairwise comparisons among treatments, we, we do see some significant differences. So for example, the chlorothalonil treated bees in red clustered separately and significantly different than the chlorothalonil probiotic bees. But it's really hard to make too many conclusions based on this because our control bees were all over the place and overlapped with a lot of our treatments. And so again, with the limited statistical power of just three hives, and again, with the five that we repeated it with and saw very similar results with not a very striking dramatic difference. But if we look a little closer at certain individual bacterial groups, like some of these, um, the phylotypes, if we kind of group them based on, on that, um, we found that certain groups like lactobacillus, which you can see the purple bar um, here in our five treatments, um, did respond in particular, this group decreased in response to um, these pesticides compared to the control. So here's like normal control level, and this is the mean of all of our replicates. And chlorothalonil, imidacloprid, and teramycin you know, reduced the abundance of uh, a relative abundance of lactobacillus, but then the chlorothalonil and probiotic restored the levels of lactobacillus to levels comparable to the control, which isn't surprising because the product is made uh, primarily of lactic acid bacteria like lactobacillus strains. And so, um, but that was really interesting to see that be restored. And so um, again, we're, we're interested in thinking about the bac bacteria that were decreased and then the normal healthy microbes that were impacted and decreased in, in exposure to these pesticides and thinking about those as potential probiotics specifically geared towards mitigating pesticide exposure. And so lactobacillus was one of them. Um, and then we're also interested in thinking about the ones that increased in these um, pesticide treatments. And one, just to point out, is the serratia, which is kind of this light blue here that was increased in the imidacloprid treatments. And that microbe is um, shown to be a opportunistic pathogen in honeybees. So um, really interesting to see that impact as well. And just like Michelle, Found, we found that antibiotics, um, as expected, decreased the total amount of bacteria using qPCR, same um, approach. And so, whereas the other um, metacloprid and chlorothalonil uh, were kind of the same levels as the controls in terms of the amount of bacteria, but the teramycin was significantly reduced in the amount of bacteria. And just to kind of link it back to what we you know, know with the human gut microbiome and, and how kind of reducing the amount and diversity can influence the immune system too. And so this kind of gets into this result a little um, as well and thinking about mites. So we also looked at how these treatments impacted mite levels um, because we know how problematic they can be. And so the controls are here in the middle now. So this is the mean mite count per 100 bees of the control highs, so pretty relatively low. Uh, and you can see that chlorothalonil and metacloprid significantly increase the mite loads. But when we uh, added the probiotic bacteria to the chlorothalonil treated bees, that brought those levels down similar to the control. So they um, might be, um, you know, the probiotic kind of 
mitigated the mite effect that we saw from these pesticides. And further looking into this and kind of looking at the mite levels in relation to the microbiome, we also found a correlation in that mite or hives that had higher mite levels, as indicated by the darker red colors, they had different gut microbiomes than the um, than, than the other hives that had low or no mite counts. So I'm trying to still figure out what the mechanism is for that, how the gut microbiome might be influencing an ectoparasite, um, if it's kind of modulated through the immune system or, or what. Um, so we're still thinking about that. If anyone has any ideas, I'd love to, to hear that too. And so just to kind of wrap up pesticides, right? We know they're widespread um, and bees encounter them. They can impact the gut microbiome. Also that the mite counts as well. So there might be something going on there. Pro the probiotics seem to have potential to mitigate these effects, but definitely more research is needed in this area. So um, definitely plan on, on continuing that. Um, and then there was this correlation between the mite infestation and the gut microbiome. And really now we need to know what that mechanism is between that. And so doing some potentially some more targeted experiments to try to tease that apart would be um, a good next step. Now I want to talk about nutrition a little bit and um, thinking about how that might impact the gut microbiome. And so my, another grad student in my lab did an experiment um, in collaboration with the West Plains Beekeepers Association, where we um, had 16 hives across two locations in, in the area, including one on campus. And basically we um, treated half of them with, fed them regular um, sucrose solution. And then the other um, half received sucrose solution with these added micronutrients and protein sources to mimic kind of an artificial nectar pollen supplement. And so we looked at the um, hive weight over time, over a season, and also the microbiome. And so we did not see a significant effect of the treatment on hive weight. So here from April to October, you can see the sugar and what we call nectar, this artificial nectar solution, um, basically tracking uh, very closely together. There were a few time points where nectar was a little higher, you know, heavier um, on average than the sugar, but that was not a significant difference. And this is just kind of grouping them all together. There's no difference in hive weight, which we were pretty surprised by. And also it did not impact the gut microbiome. And so this is um, just one time point kind of at the end of the season. And we looked across and we sampled pretty much every month. It was kind of like on a six week cycle of um, sampling. And so this is just an example plot where you can see that the, the nectar and the sugar samples are overlapping and there was not a significant difference in the gut microbiome, but this experiment turned, revealed a really, what I think is a really interesting um, result here. And so this is again, an ordination looking at the microbiome of our, um, some of, of the hives that were um, in, sampled in October and found that the hives that survived that following winter had significantly different microbiomes than those that died over the winter. Um, and so, um, this is really, really interesting, and we're definitely exploring, you know, what is a survival microbiome? What is this, um, what is indicative of the microbes that are associated with the ones that didn't make it through the winter? And so I'm really interested in maybe comparing some of our, our bacteria that are indicators with Michelle's list that she identified um, of, of some bacteria that are maybe a sign of, of not good hive or, or good hive. Um, and so this is in October, you know, right, right before winter. Um, but we also, again, this is super interesting that we also found this, um, we were able to detect this difference between hives that survived the winter and hives that died all the way back in April um, at the start of the season when the hives were first established for the experiment. Um, so, so 
there was a significant difference there as well, even though it wasn't as dramatic and distinct as it was in October, we were still able to detect that. So really um, going to be pursuing this and, and trying to figure out what's going on there. And so again, didn't really see an impact on our diet treatments on the hive weight, little effect on the microbiome. We think that maybe the outside hive food sources and the environment might be a more important driver of um, the microbiome composition because, as opposed to the in-hive feeding that we did for our treatments um, because we didn't control for that. So all the bees were you know, able to go and forage like normal. And so maybe that's kind of more um, of a driver in, in the microbiome formation than you know, these um, in-hive feeding supplements. Um, but again, we're, we're following up on, on this initial microbiome being more important for hive survival and health than, you know, our, our supplement treatments. But of course, this is only correlational. We can't say that the microbiome caused those hives to survive because we didn't do the experiment to be able to tease that apart. Um, but we are, you know, again, thinking about how we might be able to, um, recreate the survival microbiome and then test that um, to see if those hives do in fact survive better than um, hives that don't have that particular structure of um, microbes. And so lastly, I just wanna to touch on disease a little bit. This is a newer project that um, I'm collaborating with my colleagues at Virginia Tech um, through a National Science Foundation grant where we're looking at nosema and microbiome interaction. So I don't really have any data, but I'll just share with you briefly what we're working on right now. Um, so basically uh, what we're, we're trying to understand if the composition of the mid gut microbes, if that influences the ability of nosema to, you know, go inside of the endothelial cells in the mid gut and reproduce. If, if there's certain strains there. So we're really looking at, you know, within each of these bacterial types, there are different strains. And so does that make a difference in terms of their susceptibility to nosema? So the way we're gonna look at this is doing a simple exposure experiment where um, we have control hives and, and nosema hives, and then look at the outcome, those that, you know, were were infected with our experimental exposure, and then those that are resistant, and then synthetically recreate those microbiomes to test to see if the ones, you know, that um, were predicted to be susceptible that did get infected here versus the ones that are predicted to be resistant um, based on our initial experiment. So that is um, ongoing right now, and hopefully, maybe next year I can share the results of that. Um, of these studies. And so um, we kind of touched on these three things and there's just one last thing that I wanna share with you all um, is a study that I did looking at how the cage environment impacts the microbiome. And um, there's definitely value in cage experiments. And the one that Michelle described, um, she put her bees back into the hive environment after, um, you know, so but first, before she did her cage experiment, so she could confirm that, or, you know, that they could establish their normal microbiome before the experiment. Because um, what we found in these experiments is that the cage bees do have significantly different microbiomes than bees in the hive. And so we did two trials and the trials were actually uh, very different, but um, nonetheless, in both trials, we saw a cage hive um, difference in the overall microbiome. And if you look at the particular bacterial phyla, um, you just to point out here is that here's the normal, you know, kind of main uh, phyla of bacteria in the hive, but in the cage, you can see that shift where they're predominantly um, the firmicutes and, and less of some of the the other groups. And just to point out that that includes like lactobacillus and those hindgut bacteria, which isn't super surprising because when the bees are in the cage, right, they can't um, fly to defecate. And so they really accumulate a lot of hindgut bacteria. And we can see that in, in the results. And this is also the um, total amount of bacteria using the qPCR 
And again, the cage bees had significantly higher um, total amount of bacteria, again, because they aren't able to, um, to defecate. And so it, it accumulates. And so you can see that there. And um, one of the most interesting findings from this experiment that, that I think is um, we also looked at two immune enzyme activity levels, one of which being phenyl oxidase expression. And the cage bees had reduced immune response um, based on this uh, phenyl oxidase levels um, compared to the hives. And so not only is the cage environment altering the microbiome, but it's also impacting this individual immune response as well. Um, so there, there are implications of this. And I, like I said, I definitely think that cage experiments are really valuable for determining behavior and physiology and generating hypotheses. But based on what we know about the importance of the microbiome, um, and not being different in the cage environment, people, researchers might need to consider that as well. Oops. Okay, so does a solution to pollinator protection, which we're really interested in, in making, having healthy bees, does it lie in microbes? And so we've talked about probiotic bacteria. There's some products already available. There are some companies that are um, working on developing them and marketing them. There's also genetically engineered gut bacteria where um, people have been able to get the bacteria, the normal bacteria in the gut to express certain genes to control the immune system of the bee um, constitutively. So it's always kind of on, the immune system of the bee is always on. Um, there's also research on uh, fungal extracts and thinking about, you know, fungal probiotics, if you will, or the, I guess it would be kind of the, um, the extracts or the metabolites that the fungi are producing and using those to um, have healthier bees. And then also there's phage therapy, which bacteriophages are viruses that infect bacterial cells. So the green is the bacterial cell and the red are viruses that are infecting bacteria. And so this might, we might be able to use these viruses um, as a, you know, good, good viruses to control pathogenic bacteria that are, are impacting our bees too. So there's lots of potential and it'll be really interesting to see into the future, the role of microbes in kind of uh, bee health and agricultural health, human health um, as well. And so with that, I thank you all for your attention and I um, want to thank my collaborators and my funding sources, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, Jenny, I guess the first question is, has anybody studied whether the soft mite treatments like oxalic acid, hopguard, thymol affect the bee's microbiome? Um, let's see. I am not aware of any of those in particular, but they there might be um, there might be some research. Um, I know that there's been a handful of of studies out recently that are looking at various mite treatments and how that impacts the gut microbiome. But those in particular, don't know off the top of my head. Jenny, could I ask you to turn off your share screen so we can see yeah. you? Let's do Thank that. You. There we go. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, Dale. Okay, uh, Jenny, do you think that the mites are changing the gut microbiome, uh, making them uh, weak or pathogenic increases? Or do you think that the good bacteria in the microbiome is helping prevent initial mite counts take off? Yeah, good question. So that's really getting at that bi-directional relationship. Is it, it's like chicken or the egg, right? Is it the microbiome that is influencing whether or not mites are able to attach or does the mite infestation cause the, the change in the microbiome? And so with the results that we have um, now, we're not able to disentangle that relationship because it's only correlational. And so we didn't you know, have the proper controls to, to and manipulation treatments to look at that in particular. So it was just kind of a correlation. Um, it was kind of a, you know, we're really interested in and pesticide impacts on the gut microbiome and bee health, but we did find that result with the mite count. So it's definitely going to take further, um, further experiments to tease that apart. 
Um, but I could definitely see, you know, thinking about what we what we saw with the the phenyl oxidase microbiome um, result. You know, there's definitely you could see how the immune system can be influenced by the um, the gut microbiome through that signaling. And so I, you know, I could I could hypothesize it going either way, but um, don't know right now. Couple questions on uh, effective requeening, and that is, uh, does that change the microbiome in the gut, or, or does it in the hive, absent outside of, or does the hive absent outside influences maintain its microbiome? And the second part of that is, over what time period does a bot queen uh, change the gut microflora in the or the microbiome in the colony? Yeah, so. Um... It's a good question. And I, again, don't really have that answer, but uh, what we do know is that the, the primary mode of transmission of microbes within a colony is through, you know, the fecal oral route um, of, of the workers. We do know that the queen microbiome is distinct from workers and is also distinct from drones. So I imagine that the, um, you know, the queen microbiome and like how requeening and introducing a new queen with a maybe a different, slightly different microbiome. Um, I don't think that would impact the microbiome of the workers because they are different to begin with and they um, are, they get their microbes from, from each other. Um, so I don't think that that would have, uh, based on that, I don't think it would have an impact on the microbiome of the bees overall, but um, I don't know that for sure. And along that kind of, <clears throat> kind of a follow-up to that is uh, with feral bees, is there a difference in the microbiome with feral bees as compared to hive bees? Um, trying to think, yeah, because there's been some work on, you know, um, mite levels compared between managed and feral hives um, or colonies. Uh, but as far as the microbiome, I'm not thinking of any studies that I'm aware of right now that have looked at that, um, but that's a really good question. And um, yeah, I imagine they would be um, slightly different. Again, maybe it's like they, they have the same phylotypes, but it could be the relative abundance of each phylotype um, is more likely to be a variable than um, the actual presence or absence of particular microbes. What about the effect of um, migration or uh, commercial beekeepers moving from with their commercial pollination on, on single crop sources or single source pollen sources? Uh, would there be differences there in the, in the gut microbiome? Yeah, um, I think that Again, that kind of, because what we have seen in our results of our experiments over the course of the, the um, season, when there's different floral resources available, that the gut micro do, microbiome does change over time. And again, it's kind of the amount, the relative amounts of each type of bacteria shifts kind of with, with the time and um, season. And so and Michelle's work kind of um, touched on that a little bit too. And so uh, I imagine that, yeah, even like within a single time frame, if you're kind of moving them where they're exposed to different uh, floral resources that they um, would probably have some sort of shift in the amounts depending on, on what they are um, bringing in. Another interesting question is on the body temperature of infected versus non-infected bees. Is there a difference there in the... Uh, yeah, okay. so thinking about how like the body temperature might change and then how that might impact the microbiome. Right. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe, I don't know if Michelle has any insight onto that question. Because um, I, yeah, I'm not sure if anyone's looked at that. It's a good question though. Yeah, it might, because microbes are definitely very sensitive to temperature changes and with bees being, um, you know, they, they might 
have, you know, a, a response there that microbial communities might have a response, but I don't know that for sure. Probably the only thing to add to that is they keep their brood nests pretty mm -hmm. similar and tight in terms of temperature. So maybe there's, no, you know, and that's why they're cycling from the outside to the in. So what's actually happening to a bee if it's sitting at Celsius? You go to Celsius, 25 degrees as to what something would be when it's at 35. I don't, I don't know, but maybe that's why they cycle. So it prevents any of that from going on. Don't know. Worth, worth thinking about that. Yeah, it's a good point. And that would correlate with, is there a difference between summer bees and winter bees, especially in the, like the U.S. Midwest, where we have the, the big temperature changes, mm -hmm. environmental temperatures? Yeah, yeah, it's hard to say if that kind of seasonal shift, what exact environmental factor is um, kind of causing some shifts that we do see, if it's more their, their diet or, or the, the potential temperature. Or, or is it a, a difference between gathered pollen and bee bread during those different seasons? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it could be. I actually had a student research group in a capstone class that I taught, and they looked at um, the microbiome of bee bread um, in different environmental contexts and temperatures and with different starting inoculum of bacteria and um, did find that the, the microbial composition did change so um, it was just a small student project but yeah that's that's a good point too is the uh has, has or put it this way has anybody looked at the the microbiome in larvae or in pupae yes yeah so the we, same as as uh, worker bees the nurse bees it's different yes yeah, so basically um the, there are microbes that are present in those um, stages, but they are different from the fully formed worker bee um, microbiome that forms, you know, seven to 10 days after um, kind of along its um, development. And so, and there's also, so there's kind of a microbial community early on, and then it kind of drops down in terms of the amount of bacteria too. And then it kind of builds up to that um, fully established, established worker community. So yeah, it does change throughout bee development too. And then affecting, uh, factors affecting mite infestation and gut microbiome. Could there be some difference or uh, a connection with hygienic behavior? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point because um, there are definitely, you know, certain hives that that have that behavior more than others. Um, yeah, that's a really great point. I'd be interested in looking at that for sure. I'm not, I don't know. Okay, is the theory that supplementing micro microbacteria is helpful because the bees can't collect it fast enough on their own in the field? or is it because it is pure and has not been damaged by pesticide as a product? Yeah, so I think it's sort of, um, you know, they, they can be effective by kind of restoring the healthy levels. So when the bees are encountering pesticides and, you know, foraging and, um, you know, just going about, about their days, um, as they're doing that, you know, the microbiome can be affected um, as we've seen in some of our experiments. And so I think the idea is that the probiotics are just sort of boosting the, the amount um, back to, to levels where they had been you know, impacted by various environmental factors. Um, and we're seeing similar things with you know, the amphibian system, which I still continue that research too. And so we're thinking about probiotics for amphibian wildlife conservation too. And the idea is not necessarily to introduce new bacteria, novel bacteria. The idea is to introduce normal microbes that are already there in the, in, you know, as part of their normal microbiome, but increasing the abundance of them within individuals and also kind of increasing the prevalence across individuals in a hive or across hives. Um, so just kind of giving them a boost as opposed to necessarily introducing something new and is at least kind of the framework that I take on, on the probiotics. 
Is there any knowledge about the gut microbiome and the stem cell population in the gut? It's hmm, a good question. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure about that. I feel like I have more, um, more questions than answers for you all tonight. <laughs> but again, it is, it is a relatively new field and we're, we're learning more for sure. But um, yeah, these are all really good questions. So. And then uh, what was the sample size and protocol for the mite counts versus pesticide exposure? Okay, yeah, so the mite counts for that experiment, I did the sugar shake method that Rick Fell taught me. Um, and so we did standardize the number of bees that we took from each hive um, and, and then did the, um, put them on a coffee or in a container with um, the sugar and then put them on the coffee filter and then sprayed that with, with water and then just counted the number of mites um, and then kind of standardized that to, you know, number of mites per 100 bees as a, um, a unit. But the sampling uh, method was standardized across all the hives and it was that sugar shake method. Okay. Yeah. Are the gut microbiome bacteria able to be transponated from one colony to another compromised colony by transferring bees? Yes, yeah, so there is some, some research on um, transmission among hives. Um, and we know that, you know, disease, disease causing microbes can be transmitted that way too. There's also research on transmitting diseases from um, honeybees to native pollinators as well. So there's some, some research on transmission of disease causing organisms. And so, um, and there's also um, a couple groups that are researching transmission of symbiotic beneficial uh, microbes too, kind of from nectar to bee um, and focusing on that process and community assembly in the gut as well, so. Okay, any comment on the recent announcement that Nosema is hijacking iron from the bee's gut, thus not making, making it not available to the honeybee? Yeah, so iron is, um, among microbes, iron is definitely a um, limiting resource that pathogens have um, mechanisms where they sequester iron. I'm really good at that, and that's what makes pathogens, um, one way pathogens are so, um, you know, can be so problematic is, is all because of iron. Um, and so, yeah, as far as that particular result, um, yeah, I can definitely, you know, see how that would um, be an in, in outcome. But then I can also see how other symbionts in the gut, um, the, in the mid gut, and how they might, you know, also um, have mechanisms to sequester iron and kind of competitively with, with Nosema potentially. So that might be something interesting to look at as well um, and might keep that in mind too as we continue our Nosema research and the microbiome and thinking about iron um, as well now with that new result. And does the micro the microbiome of, of, try again does the microbiome affect the fat bodies of the bees? Mm. Don't know about that either. Um, but yeah, that again could be something in thinking about the, the Varroa mites and um, a potential mechanism for, for that um, correlation. But yeah, not sure about that one either. <laughs> uh, okay. In summary, do you recommend the use of direct fed microbials to beekeepers? Yeah, that's, um, I mean, I, Based on some of our results, it definitely seems like there might be uh, potential there. I, I definitely think more research is needed because my particular experiments had pretty low sample sizes um, and, and so forth, even though we did replicate them and, and so forth. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't really have a strong recommendation at this point, but um, I definitely, you know, think it's an area that we should focus our future research on to be to definitively be able to say that you know the, these products are good and I do think that we should be thinking about products that um, you know do have are evidence-based 
and do you have specific targets? Um, because, you know, the, the impacts from pesticides might be different from impacts from disease, you know, as far as which particular microbes are impacted. And so thinking about microbes that can, um, probiotics that can kind of supplement those particular microbes that are affected by the different pesticides or, or factors. Um, so, so I think more research is needed and maybe it turns out that one product or one certain type of microbe um, in terms of the probiotic is going to be able to address a lot of those factors, but um, more research is definitely needed, I think. Well, just I'll, I'll make a personal comment on that one is, is mm -hmm. that coming from the livestock side, uh, we don't always see a response with direct fed microbials. And it mm -hmm. seems that if, you know, it seems to work if they, if the animals have just been under a antibiotic treatment, as, mm -hmm. as you've talked about, mm -hmm. or if they're under uh, like shipping stress or dehydration stress, something along that line, yeah. then we tend to see a response, but under normal conditions, we generally do not see much of a response. Yeah, that's interesting. I do think that probably is what we're going to see with the bees. And so I don't know if I'd recommend necessarily like prophylactically using them um, to, you know, as a preventative, but maybe, yeah, if you are going to have to treat them with antibiotics, then supplement it with antibiotics or with probiotics too. That's a good point. I'm going to take just a second and, and make a comment on the iron question. Mm -hmm. and, and that is, I did a, a graduate seminar way back when I, when I was in grad school on fever, infection, and iron. Mm -hmm. And going through the literature, I found that when you have a, a particularly a, an intestinal infection, you tend to run a fever, which in turn, you uh, usually decrease food intake when you do that. So it's the elevated temperature is, is uh, less optimal for the pathogens and at the same time, you're cutting your food source and the, the iron food source for the pathogens. And the pathogens typically have a higher iron requirement than most of the other bacteria. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and this is Jerry. Uh, I'll, I'll jump in here. I started my career in pollution research and near smelters where heavy metals are a problem. Uh, one of my graduate students did his thesis on uh, cadmium and the question was, does cadmium induce the production of metallothionines in honeybees? And the answer is unequivocally yes. Uh, the other thing that we found out, though, is that there obviously is a competition for binding sites because one of the most, we had a gradient down the, the Silver Bowl Valley from Butte in Anaconda. And the farther down the valley you got, the farther away you were from the smelter. But one of the things that the smelter really tossed into the air and the atmosphere was zinc. And zinc generally very common crustal element. What we found is those bees where the cadmium was activating the metallothionine tended to come up deep with lower than expected levels of zinc and copper. So there was similar to what uh, Dale's talking about. We saw a really interesting set of uh, changes uh, in the bees on the, in the inorganics and in case of the metals. The other thing that I wanted to mention real quick is that our several groups in our master level classes of our online courses have looked at some of the probiotic supplements and they've come up with you know, various contradictory answers. The one thing that seems to be coming through, and again, these are small studies and oftentimes the first time any of these people ever did any research, but it just seems to be if you've got colonies that are small or struggling or seem to have some type of problem, then they sometimes saw a beneficial effect of the probiotic. But if the colonies were strong, the surprising thing is sometimes that appears like it actually not only didn't do any good, but it might actually be counterproductive. So, and again, these are, you know, consider more anecdotal than anything because these are small studies done by people doing their first research projects. But. And I think that pretty much winds up the questions we've got, Jerry. I think so, too. And we've had her on the hook for a while here. Um, Michelle, would you like to come in for a moment? And do you have any specific question or comment for um, Jenny? Um, so, yes, we should definitely chat about the uh, ones that I found just 
purely in the sick colonies because there's definitely some overlapping um, results there from yours and mine. So that would be that's quite good. Um, I, yeah, so I, I think that that's a, a really sort of, I think we're now moving to the stage where we're actually we, we're moving away from just what's in the gut now to what actually could we, how could we use this information? And so that's kind of the next you know, exciting step about, okay, well, what, how can we use this information? We don't want to be going out right now and buying, um, you know, um, prebiotics or anything like that to, to feed our bees because we don't have enough research to say that that's useful. So you have to weigh up the cost. Is it just going to make you feel good or, or you're and, and spending money or what's the deal there? So I, I wouldn't go by rushing out now, right now to do that. Yep. But within a couple of years, this might be a really interesting place for us and so one of the things I didn't talk about because I just skipped over it a little bit is is in the seasonal stuff that we were looking at um Jenny you mentioned that there wasn't a much difference between colonies well I actually found that there I admittedly it was only a very small size but I'm you know I'm looking at those five individual bees and I looked rather most of the time I pulled the data but one time I actually decided I would not pull the data I would look at um, them as individuals. And I'll just quickly flick it up and show you what happens to individual bacteria, um, if I can. There we go, I'll just share a screen with you. Um, that one here. Um, so this is, this is the bacteria in colony one, bacteria in colony two, three, four, and then five. And what you can see is that they're, they're um, dotted lines because they're oh, different bees each season. Michelle, uh, we're not seeing it. We're not seeing it, Michelle. Oh, you're not seeing it? There we go. There we go. That's better. I'll just move this over here a little there bit. There you go. There we go. So, yeah, so that so you can see that the, the Gilly Miller, which is the green one, and then there's a pink one, the Snodgrassella. You can see that the the five Bs, when you when you average them, are right at the top. Um, and then the next season they are right down the bottom, and then it shoots up in summer again. And so there was no very, there was not a really a, a good clear reasoning as to why this small sample size was was kicking everything out. So we just probably want to keep that in mind too as we go forward. Sample sizes, maybe we need to sort of work on yeah. some of those sample sizes and really get a good handle on what's going on. So. But yeah, the interesting true. thing I found about this is that if maybe each individual bee has its own microbiome balance that is going on, which is a kind of a, a strange, I mean, like that's what we were heading towards for human gut microbiome. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's where we're heading for the bees. And that's why we don't see big differences, why we may not see big differences in the colonies because these individual bees are all balancing everything. So again, it's another area that we can start to look at at some point, maybe. Yeah, definitely. I think the route of transmission, though, um, you know, in that kind of social nature of, of how they're exchanging pretty much every um, every aspect, you know, in, within the hive that, you know, that's definitely a, a pretty big difference um, mm. in that behavior. But yeah, that's a good point. And I think that's too where strain level variation is going to come into play too, is that, yeah, maybe kind of as a whole, if you group them based on at a broader relatedness, you know, that, that might be um, more consistent, but then, yeah, if you look at individual strains, there's probably a lot more variation than we I think is going on for sure. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I will have one call. We do have a few of our directors on as live panelists um, and guests like Randy. Does anyone of the panelists who actually can ask questions want to ask a question of these two speakers? Because here's the here's the rub. The Q and A thing will not allow us that are panelists to ask questions. So. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions from the panelists? Dale, do you have any questions of them? No, I think I've thrown, I I combined some of my questions with the questions that were coming from the, uh, the, on the Q and A. Okay. Well, um, I really thank everyone, um, Michelle, Jenny, Dale, for being here. I've been looking at the chat comments and you should take a moment. I will leave this up a while when we end here. So you and Michelle could look at the chats and the Q and A. And if you want to make some comments and so on, do so. And then I'll, I'll you know, I'll, I'll turn it off. But uh, 
we will have a recording up, but overall, you, you'll be pleased with the chat comments. Uh, people really like your presentations. Uh, a few people commented about things aren't as simple as they seemed. And uh, the, um, you know, as I said to, to both of our doctors here today, and I'm pleased to call them doctors, um, when I started out, molecular biology wasn't even a thing. <laughs> In fact, is um, I'm, I will have to name drop here. I was a naturalist in the late 60s in Yellowstone National Park working at Norris, which was the hottest and the most dangerous area because it was both hot and acid. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of the pools and stuff in Yellowstone are alkaline. And a gentleman from the, from the Midwest by the name of Dr. Brock came out and he was the first to find bacteria growing in hot water. Mm -hmm. And he had a heck of a time getting the science community to believe that uh, they were actually living and thriving there. Mm -hmm. the, the argument was, well, proteins denature at about 80 degrees, so they can't possibly be there. <laughs> and he, and the reason I got to know him very well was that I was his guide for his graduate students in himself through the springs of Norris in the back country where the most uh, interesting springs are at. And, you know, I was in grad school myself, so that was really fun. But um, little did I realize that the findings that he had from those bacteria and the thermophiles would lead to all of the, uh, was a fundamental part of what we're doing nowadays in the molecular work with the PCRs and so on. So I can name drop because he was a formative person. And anytime you get frustrated with your work, and if somebody is saying, well, gee, I haven't seen that before and so on, just remember that Brock had the entire science community saying he had to be wrong. And so he had two experiments I really liked. One was he had glass slides laying in the runoff streams, one of these pools with uh, on the one half of the slide, he was, uh, he had a, like a curtain across. And on the one hand, he had UV lights shining down. The other hand, he had dark and he was getting, the, of course, the bacteria growth, growth depending on the type of bacteria on the light or the dark side. So that that was aimed at this, they're dead and just, you know, flowing off and sticking to your slide. But my favorite was he had a apartment uh, in a motel in West Yellowstone. And I visited him and his students one day and he had a stove and on top of the stove were pressure cookers. And every pressure cooker had an inoculum that he was growing to prove that those bacteria could thrive in that kind of a environment. So, so as I say, this wasn't even a choice of a career when I went through. <laughs> but I really think that this is an area that the whole gut microbiome, how it ties into the stress and nutrition is a critically important one. And if I had, you know, since I'm retired, I don't really, except for my holdover, Scott, we're not taking on any new graduate students, but if I would have, have advised one of an area to go into it would have been what you two ladies are both mm -hmm. doing. So, I'm pleased to see that the registrations for this particular conference were well over 600. I thought maybe it'd be more technical and the WAS audience and others would say, oh, I don't know about that. But if you look at the comments, uh, people seem to really enjoyed your presentation. And I noticed Dale up there nodding in agreement with me. Uh, yeah. This is really important work. Uh, we understand it is very preliminary. I'm thrilled to death to see it, it ongoing and I'm also happy if I played a little part in the role of getting the nutritionist, uh, Dale there, combined with two uh, cutting edge people working on this, one in the southern hemisphere and one in the northern one. So uh, th th that's a nice little bonus to this particular one. A few people commented that they were losing audio with Jenny's talk. I don't know what's going on there because it was coming through fine to me and obviously to most other people. Uh, I would ask people in chat who said that they couldn't hear the audio to send me an email uh, at, and I use a, an American online um, account for my general email. And it's simply B research, like in honeybee, B E E at AOL.com. Please send me a note and tell me what you're using and Jaylene, so Jaylene and I can try to figure out why a few of you were not hearing the sound uh, of Jenny. Now, I know why they weren't finding the sound when I was trying to play the ad of Oliveros. I lost my, my screen on that thing. I had to go back and retrieve it. But uh, 
Um, next time around, I'll be better at that. But uh, 